Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today, we're delighted to bring you the fourth program in AJC's six-part series titled A Life in the Trenches, an Oral History with AJC CEO, David Harris. Today, David, in conversation with AJC Chief of Staff to the CEO, Jillian Laskowitz, will share highlights and lessons learned from a lifetime of Jewish activism. A passionate Jewish advocate, David has led AJC since 1990 and has been referred to by the late Israeli president, Shimon Peres, as the foreign minister of the Jewish people. He has been honored more than 20 times by foreign governments for his international work, making him the most decorated American Jewish organizational leader in US history. After we hear from David and Jillian, time permitting, we will take your questions. You can email your question to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. And now Jillian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire, and hello and welcome back to our global audience. David, as Claire mentioned, we are discussing highlights and lessons learned of your over four decades long career in Jewish advocacy. It's going to be difficult to fit all of this into one hour, but let's start at the beginning. So in 1990, I've heard you discuss that between August 1990 and March 1991, I believe, this coincided with, with the Gulf crisis when Iraq invaded Kuwait and also coincided with you becoming CEO of AJC. I believe you led four separate trips to the region, including in the middle of, of these missiles. Um, in doing so, you, you sort of set this new tone from AJC right from the start. So let's start. Why did you make that decision at the time? First of all, hello everyone, and Julian, thank you for leading the conversation um, again. And my advocacy, of course, began in, in 1975, so even 15 years earlier. But we're talking about the um, AJC CEO piece of the story, which began, as you said, in 1990. And my, my start more or less coincided with um, Iraq Saddam Hussein, who took over Kuwait in August of 1990 and then began to threaten Israel, uh, ultimately leading to missile attacks from Iraq to Israel um, in January of 1991. And I felt right from the get-go in my tenure, it was important to make clear um, my priorities. And centrally, that was Israel. So yes, uh, we went in uh, August of 1990 uh, to understand what the implications of Saddam Hussein's move were for Israel. We went back in, I believe it was December, as things heated up. Uh, in January, we were on the first plane to Israel after the first Scud missile struck. And I would say that um, uh, we were, we were uh, three from AJC. Uh, Sholem Komei was then the president. At a moment's notice, he dropped everything and joined. Uh, Al Moses was chair of the Board of Governors. Uh, he joined as well at a moment's notice. The three of us went. We were on an empty plane, other than uh, the late comedian Jackie Mason, who uh, also wanted to go in order to do whatever he could to sort of strengthen morale uh, as the Scud missiles began falling. And then in March, uh, as the war ended, we had a very large group of 130, 140 people from AJC who, who, who went in order to show their solidarity with Israel as Israel rebuilt uh, and recovered from the war. So from the get-go, Israel was at the center of our universe. Absolutely. And David, I know another highlight for you and your career at AJC is the Belchitz Memorial in Poland, the Holocaust Memorial. I know AJC and you yourself had a key role in establishing this. So can you tell us a bit more about this story? Sure. Uh, many may not know the name Belzec, B-E-L-Z-E-C, uh, and are surprised when they hear uh, it for the first time and learn that roughly 500,000 Jews were exterminated 
at this one Nazi death camp located in southeastern Poland. Uh, Miles Lerman was uh, for many years the chair of the US Holocaust Museum. He himself was from Poland and he lost much of his family uh, in Belgians. And for years he had wanted to memorialize the site. The site was largely left untended and he felt this needed to be corrected. And after Poland regained its democracy in 1989, he saw the chance. To make a very long story short, uh, the Holocaust Museum initially wanted to engage this project and then changed its mind. And so Miles Lerman came to me and he said, David, uh, AJC has developed a very special relationship with Poland, which was true. Uh, in the 1990s, would you consider taking on this project and I will help you. Uh, and it was really in a way beyond our capabilities, but nonetheless, who could say no to this? Uh, and so we, we said we would do it. So Miles Lerman uh, joined with AJC in what became a multi-year, very complex project to try and memorialize this site I want to give a special shout out to an AJC colleague, Rabbi Andrew Baker, who took on the day-to-day -day challenge of dealing with, um, with uh, the architects, the Polish government, um, other Jewish groups, those particularly concerned about um, the care for the deceased. Uh, and at the end of the day, we had, for me, one of the most powerful and memorable days of my entire life, which was the opening of this site. Uh, in fact, I'll be going back there again in a few days with some AJC leaders to revisit the site, uh, which is visited now by thousands and thousands of, of, of Polish and other visitors each year. Uh, but again, 500,000 Jews exterminated within less than one year, followed by an attempt by the Germans to hide all traces of um, the tragedy. There were exactly two survivors of Belgians, two, one of whom was killed in a pogrom in Poland after the war upon returning home, and the other later committed suicide, perhaps unable to live with what had been experienced. Uh, but um, it's a site well worth seeing, and um, I, I hope more people on this call and elsewhere time when they visit Europe to seek out Belgians and see the remarkable um, site, including a museum that AJC helped construct. Absolutely. And David, you've also discussed the opening of our Berlin office as one of the highlights for you. So I guess part one of the question is, can you talk a little bit about that? Part two, I know another enduring AJC success was persuading the German government to add a permanent museum to um, the center of Berlin. That museum was not originally part of the plan from what I understand. So how did you and AJC accomplish this as well? Let me take the second one first and you know, apologies to the audience, but when you've worked as long as I have in the Jewish world and especially um, on this AJC platform, there are lots of highlights <laughs> and I, I hope we'll get to um, uh, some more along the way. When the German government announced this dramatic decision to set aside an entire square block in the center of Berlin, uh, across the street from the Tiergarten, which is the, uh, uh, the central park, if you will, of Berlin, um, and very close to the Brandenburg Gate, it, it just doesn't get more central than that. Uh, there was a competition, and some of the people on this call will have seen what resulted, uh, an entire block dedicated to a, I would say, a fairly um, abstract um, interpretation of Holocaust memory. Uh, I will admit uh, that it, uh, it doesn't really speak to me personally. But when we saw the plans um, and they were already decided upon, the piece that was really missing for us was how do you turn the abstract into something much more concrete and real? Uh, especially if you think ahead years and even decades uh, to those who may not understand at first glance what this is all about. 
this sort of missing space in the center of Berlin representing the loss of Jewish life um, in Germany as a result of the Shoah. So we, we, we pressed um, the, our friends in the German government, and many of you know, AJC has long had a very special relationship with, with Germany, uh, sort of uniquely positioned after the Second World War to engage with the new Germany. And we made this point very respectfully. Um, we're not here to comment on your the design you accepted, although again, not, not, not my taste, but so what? But what's missing is a museum, something informational. And at the end of the day, to the credit of the German government, they agreed. And for those who visit the site, and I hope many will, uh, you will see in the far corner, the farthest point from the central, from, from the tier garden, you will see a museum that goes underground that tells the story. And I dare say that museum would not be there, Jillian, uh, these last uh, two decades and more, were it not for AJC's um, intervention and advocacy. As for uh, opening the office in Berlin, which was another big milestone uh, for AJC and actually for Germany, it was the first such office of its kind, um, opened by an American Jewish group in post-war Germany. Uh, here, the initial credit goes to um, a wonderful uh, longtime AJC leader named David Squire from Boston, who called me one day uh, many years ago and out of the blue said to me, David, how are you doing? What do you think about opening an office uh, in Berlin? <laughs> and um, I kind of had this out of body experience where I heard myself say, absolutely, of course, love to. And then hung up and said to myself, well, what did I just agree to? <laughs> no proper consultation, no real knowledge of what's going on. But the story um, is, um, is, is an interesting story of a, a very prominent Jewish family in Berlin that um, was given back the land that had been stolen from it by the Nazis. Um, and they had no particular use for the land after, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So they sold it to a Berlin developer who wanted to build a, um, uh, an office building uh, on what was once upon a time Leipziger Platz. Again, very much in the center of Berlin, right adjacent to Potsdamer Platz, Platz, which is the geographic center of Berlin. Um, and the, the family sold it to the developer with a couple of conditions. One condition was their name would be on the building. The second condition was that the building would have a living Jewish presence. Uh, and the third was that um, their nephew, who himself was an architect in Boston, would be involved in the design of the building. So the developer accepted those conditions. And when it came to the living Jewish presence, the family, some of you will know the name Mosse. George Mosse was a famous professor at the University of Wisconsin on the history of fascism. Um, it was the Mosse family knew AJC's work in Germany, approached David Squire, who was their friend, and said, David, you, know, you think AJC would want to do this? And David said, let me check with David Harris. And that's how it all unfolded. So we, AJC, became the first tenants, if you will, free of charge, in the first building built in unified Berlin on the Leipziger Platz, uh, which today is now filled with new buildings. Um, it's, a, it's an octagon. Our next door neighbor, as I recall, is the Canadian Embassy. And so it's, it's very well positioned. Uh, and ever since 1998, we have occupied that building as the first Jewish organization outside Germany to open a full-time office like this in Berlin. Thank you, David. It's, it's really an incredible story of, of how the Berlin office became, came about. Um, staying in Europe- By the way, I had to shout out, if I may, to my longtime AJC colleague, Jean Dubau, who became our first Botschafter. <laughs> the German word for ambassador, although without the diplomatic immunity, I'm sorry to say, but became our first um, AJC um, director in Berlin and really got the concept off and running with a full program and exchange of programs. And ultimately, of course, it led to our idea in 2020, and I know we'll come to it, Jillian, 
to have a global forum in Berlin, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so staying in Europe, Let's discuss some of our other European offices and those openings, because I know those are specific highlights of your career as well. So let's discuss the Transatlantic Institute in Brussels and how that office came about. In 2003, uh, as a result of tensions between parts of Europe and the United States, especially over the Iraq war, um, we asked ourselves at AJC, if we're transatlanticists and we are, and we believe in, in the importance of the unity of, of, of Europe and the United States in addressing global issues and sharing global values. What's our role here? Is it simply to watch from the sidelines as these debates unfold between the so-called old Europe, uh, in the words of Donald Rumsfeld and the United States, or can we do something? And so um, the idea emerged that we actually create a transatlantic institute in Brussels, and there was no such transatlantic institute in Brussels. Brussels being Europe's capital, that is the center of the European Union, the home of NATO. Uh, and, um, and so on, on one AJC occasion, uh, I was asked to sort of share my wish list with AJC members of the Board of Governors and other AJC leaders. And I included the vision of a transatlantic institute and a wonderful couple from Washington, D.C., uh, the late Rhoda and Jordan Baruch, the parents of one of our uh, executive council members, Bobby Baruch, uh, came up to me after <laughs> that session. And they said, David, uh, we heard this idea about a transatlantic institute. Um, are, you, are you for real? And I was pleasantly caught off guard. And I said, absolutely for real. And they said, OK, we will make it happen. And we will guarantee the first six years of its existence just for starters. And that led Jason Isaacson and, and, and myself to very quickly travel to Brussels to explore exactly how to, to open the office, where to open the office. And soon enough, uh, Julian, within a year, the office was open. We had a gala event in Brussels. Uh, it became the hottest ticket in Brussels that evening. We had an amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, uh, my goodness, we had the Spanish foreign minister, the Belgian foreign minister, uh, the EU uh, foreign minister, Javi Solana. Uh, we had uh, the US ambassador to NATO, Nick Burns, who, who has just become the US ambassador to China. Uh, we, of course, had the Israeli ambassador. Uh, we had a whole host of people uh, wanting to speak and wanting to be associated with the idea. And other than the fact that it was um, uh, uh, boiling hot because the air conditioning system broke down in the hotel, um, otherwise it was a fantastic evening and it launched this, again, unique AJC initiative, uh, the Transatlantic Institute, which today is so skillfully led by Daniel Schwamenthal and is an essential pillar of the work we do in Europe and globally. Thank you. And David, one of our newest offices is AJC Central Europe, which is based in Warsaw and covers seven countries. You're a veteran in dealing with Poland specifically, which I'd like to discuss later in the conversation. But what was the reasoning? Why did we open an office in Warsaw? Because um, to me, it was a missing part of, of our architecture. Um, Europe is critical. The transatlantic relationship is vital to our understanding of the world. Um, and these were all countries, um, and we identified seven, Jillian, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the four so-called Visegrad states, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. Uh, these are all countries that have very um, intense Jewish histories, uh, very complicated Jewish histories, but histories that continue to play out to this day, and Poland is a prime example, uh, where we, we continue to, uh, to engage, sometimes to argue, to debate, but it's ongoing. These are also seven countries that have developed post-communism, um, very good relations with the United States. They're all members of NATO. By the way, AJC played a part um, in their accession to NATO by advocating for it um, energetically. Uh, they're all um, close to Israel uh, in their post-communist 
um, era. So there's an awful lot going on, but it was that missing piece. And um, we had to decide um, where should it be located amongst these seven countries. And the logical place for me at least was Poland. Uh, Prague is probably the friendliest city in many respects, but Poland is the, is the key city. Uh, it's not just the geographic center, it's the largest of the seven countries and the layers of complexity um, are, are, are so many that we felt this was exactly the right place to be. So we located the office in Warsaw. And once again, as with the Transatlantic Institute, some wonderful lay people stepped up and said, um, we believe in this vision, we believe in this dream. Uh, they began with John Shapiro and his wife, Shawnee Silverberg, and they were joined by Harry Schleifer, Gail Binderman and Steve Zelkowitz, um, and they helped make that possible. And now, in literally just a few days, many of us will be going back to Warsaw to mark the fifth anniversary of that office, which we opened in 2017 at the magnificent Poland Museum, which is the Museum of the History of Jews in Poland and a must visit for anyone who goes to Poland. So that celebration is just around the corner. Thank you for that context, David. Another unique piece of AJC's architecture is our Belfort Institute for Latino and Latin American Affairs, otherwise known as BILA. This flourished under your leadership. What was your vision for BILA and, and what are some of the highlights? Well, maybe I should step back for just a moment, Julian, to talk about the fact that when, when, when I took this job in 1990, um, I was invited to create a new vision for AJC. The 1980s had not been kind to the organization, a series of self-inflicted wounds. And that gave me much more, if you will, running room and latitude to ask what should the next sort of chapter in AJC's story life look like? And for me, it was global Jewish advocacy. Uh, it came about in large measure because of the dramatic events of 1989, 1990, 1991, when the Soviet empire began to unravel and ultimately the Soviet Union itself came apart and you had 15 successor states to the Soviet Union and you had that string of East European nations that had sometimes been called satellite states that were now um, free and charting their own post-communist path. So I saw lots and lots of opportunities uh, strategically for the Jewish world. And that led to a broader vision of, okay, so that's the European piece. Uh, we already had, um, beginning of the late 1980s, an Asian Pacific Institute, um, which began then and, and was first spearheaded by Bruce Raymer, uh, uh, an honorary national president. Um, so the missing pieces for us were um, going to be Africa uh, and Latin America. Uh, and in the case of Latin America, uh, we were able to hire a real dynamo, we call her a force of nature, Dina Siegel Van, Mexican born who herself shared the vision of an institute that would focus on Latin America, on its Jewish communities, on the relations between those communities and countries and both Israel and the United States. And as one other essential piece, relations between Latinos and Jews here in the United States. So it's a very complex chessboard. Uh, and from that emerged Billa. Uh, the B is for Belfer, for Robert Belfer and his family who made it possible. Um, and we just had the, the most recent strategic forum of Billa in Panama, brought together all the Jewish communities, many of the ambassadors and others. Um, and the final piece of this um, architecturally was Africa. And here, Marion and Stan Bergman of New York and originally of South Africa came along to us and said, we believe in, in Africa, we believe in its potential, both to engage the United States and Israel, and we want to help make it possible. So as we speak today, AJC, I, I think we can say has a unique architecture of a full-time staff African Institute, a Latino and Latin American Institute, Transatlantic Institute with, um, with seven offices and posts across Europe, an, Afri an Asian Pacific Institute with personnel on the ground in three countries in the region as well, 
uh, as well as a string of partnerships. So the goal was, and I think has been largely achieved, to create a global architecture to match the global vision. Absolutely. And David, can you talk to us a bit about AJC's merger with Project Interchange, which as the audience might know, these are our trips taking global leaders to Israel. I'm not sure everyone knows the backstory. There was a very uh, uh, far-sighted um, dynamic woman named Deborah Berger who lived in Washington, DC. I had the pleasure of knowing um, beginning in the 1980s who together with a friend had a vision uh, and the vision was uh, to try and introduce Israel on the ground to key leaders in the United States who might never have been, who might have no sort of understanding of what Israel is, perhaps only through the media. And we all know that that could be uh, <laughs> a, a skewed or distorted vision. So her goal was to create Project Interchange as a freestanding operation that would identify and bring delegations of American leaders, non-Jews, but political leaders or religious leaders, other civic leaders to Israel. Uh, take them there for a week or 10 days, show them everything. Show, show them soup to nuts um, and uh, let them form their own opinions. Don't try and propagandize, don't try and brainwash, don't try and, 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 um, and, and um, prevent them from meeting people who might have critical views. Show them everything in the belief that ultimately Israel will sell itself. And she was a thousand percent right. Uh, and, and well into the 90s, the 1990s, Deborah called and said, you know, David, I can't do this as a, as a freelancer forever. We need to find a permanent home. And we, uh, I, Deborah Berger, my husband, Paul Berger, and our partners believe that AJC is the right home. You're very Israel focused. You have credibility. Um, you, 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 you share the, the outlook of Project Interchange. Would you take it over? And that led to um, a very exciting merger in which Project Interchange became um, an integral part of AJC. And um, we tried to respect Deborah's vision and uh, we've expanded it. Um, so we went from a few missions a year to pre-COVID -pre well, well into 2025 missions a year, roughly every two weeks. The other big strategic change that we made was to add a, an international dimension so that uh, Project Interchange today has over 6,000 alumni. By the way, they include um, notable Americans like Pete Buttigieg, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who is now the new US ambassador to India, uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, the, the Georgia politician, uh, uh, Gabby Giffords, uh, the Congresswoman from, um, from Arizona, uh, the president of Stanford University, uh, the presidents of many other universities, uh, many Latino, African-American civic leaders, uh, not to mention a whole slew of ambassadors, foreign ministers from other countries. And most recently, I'm most excited about the first project interchange trip from the Arab world that brought um, uh, leaders from Morocco, Bahrain, and the UAE to Israel, not under the radar, openly, um, and uh, a huge success, and more of that to come. So Deborah Berger is no longer with us, but her legacy lives on through this extraordinary program that she began uh, called Project Interchange, which is now AJC Project Interchange. Absolutely, more to come. And David, in, in 2006, I know AJC celebrated our 100th anniversary gala. I've heard you discuss this and you've mentioned it as, as one of the top highlights of your career. So can you share with us a little bit about why this was so memorable? Well, first of all, because it was the centenary, so that in itself um, was meaningful. Uh, but we did it at the National Building Museum in Washington. We had nearly 3,000 people in attendance. And I think, I think I can say we assembled in person perhaps the most powerful dais that any Jewish organization had ever assembled 
um, in U.S. history. Uh, we had on the stage uh, the President of the United States, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, the Chancellor of Germany. They were all there. Uh, it was a great evening, but I'll, I'll tell you just um, one funny side story. Um, because my, my mother raised me to try to be polite to people, uh, toward the end of the evening as, as, as the program uh, came to a close, uh, and I said goodbye to those distinguished guests, I went to the exit doors and I tried to say goodbye to as many of our nearly 3,000 people as I could. Um, and I, I'm slightly exaggerating, but half the people said to me, lovely evening, but why did you invite George Bush? I didn't vote for him. And half the people said, lovely evening, but why did you invite the UN Secretary General? The UN is hopelessly anti-Semitic. And I'd say 100% of the people said, thank you for inviting the German Chancellor. Now, bearing in mind that this is a Jewish organization <laughs> and that this was what, um, 61 years after the Second World War, the fact that Angela Merkel <laughs> could unite our entire audience while the American president and the UN Secretary General divided our audience, I think suggested you know, what's possible, which led me to say um, uh, at some point that if this is doable, then in 25 years, we may be hosting an Iranian leader who actually um, embraces Jews, recognizes Israel, and is friendly with the United States. So stay tuned, everyone. We're not there yet. Uh, we have more years to go, but um, one day, there could be an Iranian leader on our stage representing a new and different Iran, just as we had a German leader representing a new and different Germany. <laughs> wow, everyone, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, we talk a lot about the next generation of Jewish advocates. And AJC offers programming for high school students called our Leaders for Tomorrow program. I wanted to ask how this came about and how it's evolved since its inception. Well, this is another one of those stories, Julian, where the credit goes outside the agency um, and not to uh, the staff. We have a, a, a wonderful um, uh, leader in New York named Corey Berger, uh, who has been very actively involved with our women's leadership group. And the oldest of her three children was um, in high school at the time. Um, and his name was Ryan Berger. And he and his mom asked if they could come see me. And I said, sure. Uh, and um, in, the, in the office where I'm sitting right now, uh, Corey prompted Ryan, who was in 10th grade, and maybe a little shy, um, to tell his story. And he told the story very eloquently. What he said essentially was, um, David, um, you guys are focused on university campuses and the challenges that Jewish and pro-Israel kids face on campuses, and I get that, you're right, but I'm here to tell you something else. The problems have trickled down to some high schools, including my own, and we have a situation in my school where we have a chairman of the social studies department who detests Israel and will not even put any map on the wall that includes Israel. And he is teaching us. And obviously, it's an asymmetrical power situation because he's also the one who gives us grades. He's also the one who will write letters of reference or not for us. So said Corey, what do we do? Teach us uh, what AJC does for a living, which is diplomacy and advocacy, um, and, 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 and empower us who are still in high school, um, how to deal with that kind of a situation. Uh, and of course, that will also redound to the benefit once we get to college. And again, the truth of the matter, just like with the Belzhitz uh, Memorial Project in Poland, you know, we, we were not equipped in our own minds to deal with, with high school uh, age kids. We were focusing, as he said, largely on college age and post-college. But it was one of those things, just like Miles, Lerm Miles Lerman's request for Belgians, where it was impossible to say no. It was impossible to si simply send them off and say, well, it's a wonderful idea, Corey, and 
you know, we'll give it some thought, but knowing already that it was going to go nowhere. He needed this. As a young Jew, he was asking for this. And so once again, you know, I heard myself saying yes. And once they left, <laughs> you know, wondering, oi, gewalt, you know, how do we do this? I can barely manage my own three teenage children at the time. What are we going to do with a teenage program? But we, we experimented. We had some great staff here, Lily Platt, Sefi Kogan, and others um, who joined in. And we, we did an, an experimental year, year one, with Corey and uh, a number of his friends from various high schools, uh, about 30. They were a terrific group. Uh, we learned a lot that year. By year two, we added Chicago. Uh, and by now, to fast forward, we're in 12 or 13 cities across the country. Uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alumni who are not only in high schools, but in colleges, and in some cases now post-college. Uh, I'd love to see this expand further. I'd love to see this franchise so that in places where AJC doesn't have bricks and mortar, uh, but where there may be synagogues or, or interested parent groups uh, where we, we do this, our kids cannot show up unprepared or blindsided for what may be coming, hopefully not, but may be coming in their high schools or in their colleges. So I see Lyft as absolutely vital. Uh, it's not enough, but it's certainly a serious response to how to deal with the challenges that Jewish and pro-Israel kids increasingly are finding in educational settings, whether here in New York or across the country, whether in high school or in college. Yes, and David, I know one of our other top priorities at AJC is chartering a new path for Muslim Jewish relations, which brings us to the Memorandum of Understanding with the Muslim World League, which you alluded to earlier. Can you tell us more about this effort? Well, I'm one who believes that the 20th century, Jillian, for AJC was to some substantial degree defined by um, our attempt to write a new chapter in Christian Jewish relations, and especially in Catholic Jewish relations. And there were some extraordinary people here at AJC on staff who devoted their professional lives to doing exactly that. Um, Zach Schuster, uh, the legendary rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, his successor, who thankfully is still writing books and articles, Rabbi Jim Rudin, all the way up to the present with Rabbi David Rosen, Rabbi Noam Marins, and their colleagues. Um, but in 1965, there was a veritable revolution in Christian Jewish relations. It came. It was called the Second Vatican Council. It produced a document called Nostre Tate. And that document revolutionized the relationship between Catholics and Jews after depending on how you count, nearly 1,900 years of Catholic persecution of Jews, Catholic teaching of contempt, Catholic teaching of the deicide charge, uh, and, and everything that unfolded therefrom. So from 1965 forward, there was the implementation of the Second Vatican Council um, revolution, in which AJC was again profoundly involved across our regional offices around the world, uh, because from the Vatican, it had to trickle down to every parish uh, across the United States, throughout Latin America, Europe, uh, Africa, Asia. But those alive today, I think would agree, there has been an extraordinary change in Christian Jewish relations. And not just the Catholic church, but the Lutheran church and others um, also engaged in self-examination. And AJC was there every stage of the way. This is one of those sort of ginormous stories uh, that I don't think AJC tells well enough of when asked, what distinguishes you as an organization and what are your serious accomplishments? This is huge. And we determined against that backdrop that the 21st century should be a century devoted to trying to help write a new chapter in Muslim-Jewish relations. 
there are an estimated 1.5 or 1.6 billion Muslims around the world. Uh, they are significant majorities in over 50 countries and growing minorities, including here in the United States and many other uh, nations. Uh, this is the new interreligious frontier. And we have skill, we have experience, we have um, patience, we have perseverance. Uh, and that led in um, April of 2019 to a, a huge step forward globally. And that was the signing of a memorandum of understanding between AJC and the Muslim World League, which I need to point out is headquartered in Mecca, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, the home of the two holy mosques, and Mecca, the holiest of the holy cities of Islam. A huge breakthrough. This followed on the footsteps of a domestic initiative, which we had launched um, uh, in 2016, called the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, which was a US-based effort, which then spawned a number of regional efforts um, uh, feeding into the national effort. But this took it to a whole new global level. Uh, and um, I'm looking at the MOU on my wall, just opposite um, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, the first uh, of, the, of the provisions was that together, uh, we would travel to Auschwitz to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of, of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And indeed, in January of 2020, a delegation of over 60 Muslim leaders from some 20 countries, led by Dr. Mohammed Al-Issa, the head of the Muslim World League in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and an AJC delegation traveled together, marched under the entrance with the infamous words, Arbeit macht frei, spent five hours or more in Auschwitz and Birkenau, uh, Time permitting, I can tell you some very powerful stories about the impact of that visit um, on all of the Muslim participants who were seeing this for the first time. But I will simply say that one of those memories etched forever came at the very end. We were in Birkenau, which, were, which was the killing fields of the Jews. We were near the remnants of the crematoria. It was the end of a long day and our Muslim partners took out um, prayer rugs out in the open, 20 feet, 30 feet from the remnants of the crematoria. And they offered a memorial service in memory of the 6 million who were killed. Uh, <laughs> if there are moments that sort of tell you this is all worth it, um, our lives can make a difference. We can see change, history can move forward. That was one of those moments. And thankfully, it wasn't just us who saw it, but the New York Times, the BBC, Al Arabiya, and just about every other major media outlet, outlet captured it um, and, and reported it. So it's, it's there in the history books. And it's only the beginning, Jillian, only the beginning. Absolutely. So David, we've discussed some of the major public highlights and the architecture of AJC. But I'd also like to go behind the scenes and oh. maybe ask you, maybe ask you some uh -oh. questions that I would guess many on this call would like to know as well, if you'll allow me. Um, Let's see. So, <laughs> <laughs> you've met with countless world leaders over the past four decades, and out of all the world leaders that you've met with, who would you say is the the single most interesting political leader you've ever met? Oh. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll offer two. Um, I think the most charismatic, uh, the most impressively intelligent, uh, um, politician that I met uh, has to be Bill Clinton as president. And again, those of you who know me know this is not a partisan statement, um, but when Bill Clinton walked into a room uh, there was there was an electricity. Uh, I remember sitting at a table with him um, in the White House to discuss the Iran issue. For an hour and a half, he spoke as knowledgeably as anyone I've ever met, without notes, 
without a need to rely on staff. Uh, and he was able to weave between being this extraordinarily thoughtful, intelligent, informed person, and also having fantastic people skills, which allowed him to sort of go back and forth and make people feel comfortable in his presence. The other person that really stands out for me is Joschka Fischer, who for many years was the foreign minister of Germany. And the reason I mention him is mostly because of the improbable background. Uh, as I recall, Joschka Fischer never finished high school. High school. He was essentially self-taught. And for his young years, he was a, a radical. If one looks him up, you'll see that through that tumultuous period of 1968, uh, for example, he was out in the streets and he was confronting the police um, and he was challenging, you know, German doctrine. Um, but he evolved, he matured into this extremely respected, very knowledgeable um, foreign minister. And what especially impressed me as a Jew was that Joschka Fischer, who had been associated with radicals in Germany who were hostile to Israel, turned around because of Entebbe. Some people may forget that the, 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 the terrorist uh, uh, assault that led to Entebbe was both Palestinian and German. And when, when Joschka Fischer, as he said, saw the German terrorists creating a selection line between the Jewish and non-Jewish passengers on the plane, he realized, he said, that the terrorists were recreating the Nazis, even though they thought they were quite the opposite. Um, and he became one of Israel's best friends in the world. He became close to the Jewish community. He became a great friend of AJC. And I think he's another standout. Time permitting, there are lots more, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. I also want to get into some of the tougher conversations you've had while conducting AJC advocacy. I know you've mentioned your conversations with French President Jacques Chirac, um, and you're also known for your diplomatic composure. So I wanted to ask, have you ever lost that composure in a meeting? The Jacques Chirac uh, conversation was particularly memorable. First of all, I have to say that you know, he was president of France and he did something which no previous French leader had done since the war. And that was acknowledged that, that Vichy was France. Vichy was not some foreign body that implanted itself in France during the war and collaborated with Germany. Vichy was French. And for both my parents who had lived in France, my mother from 1929 on and my father from 1938 on, that was a huge uh, admission and step forward for which I have great respect. But uh, as anti-Semitism re-emerged in Europe in 2000, 2001, and we've talked about that, Jillian, um, uh, on another call, the epicenter of that resurgence was France. So it was logical for us to go back to Paris, to meet with French leaders, to, to talk about the issue and how, how, how to try and, and stem it. Uh, and Jacques Chirac was the person we met with on several occasions, including very intimately in his office, around a coffee table, not around a formal conference table. And I still remember, I can still hear his words sort of ringing in my ear when we said, Mr. President, there is a problem. Anti-Semitism is returning. Jews in France are increasingly nervous. They're looking over their shoulder. They're worried. They're wondering if they have a future in France. And, and, and I won't repeat the French words, though the French words are, are really stuck here. But he looked at us and he said, I'm translating, uh, my friends, I know France better than you. There is no anti-Semitism here in France. Um, and that led to a very difficult discussion and more difficult discussions. Um, and by the way, though they were difficult, Julian, we came as friends, not enemies of France. We knew we needed to enlist the leadership of France if we were going to successfully um, together mount the strategy with the French Jewish community, with, with other people of goodwill. But uh, looking back on that one, 
Jacques Chirac um, missed it uh, early on. I, I can't speculate. I don't want to be smart alecky, but maybe had he and his colleagues seen it earlier, seen what we saw, seen what French Jews saw and felt, maybe this could have been nipped in the bud earlier. Instead, here we are 21 years later, 22 years later, and grappling with a phenomenon that is very much present. Um, David, I've also heard you mention your meeting with the Russian foreign minister, Evgeny Primakov. I know this was a memorable meeting for you if you'd like to share with the audience as well. Oh. But you also asked about the Austrian foreign minister in between. Did I miss that one? Right. Um, I remember you speaking about the Austrian foreign minister and it was a meeting where I think you've lost your composure. Yeah, you asked me if I lost my composure. This is probably where I came closest. I mean, I, <laughs> I still haven't reached the point where I've sort of banged the table and stormed out the door and slammed the door behind me uh, and gone to the press and cursed out um, um, a country leader. You know, that's not me, that's not AJC. Um, <laughs> there were moments where I might've wished I did, but there was a meeting with an Austrian foreign minister years ago. And I wanna stress this was um, at a time when Austria was still very much, not just annoyingly neutral, but did not see its own responsibility to the state of Israel, unlike Germany. Now Austria has changed, and maybe we'll get to that story. But this foreign minister, this is probably 20 years or so ago, Julian, essentially constructed the conversation by saying to, to, to us, to me, uh, David, I've just been to Auschwitz on a visit. Now here's what I need to ask from you in return. And that formulation of an Austrian foreign minister a few decades after the war, the same Austria that had produced Adolf Hitler and Adolf Eichmann and many others, essentially saying to me, well, I've now gone to Auschwitz. So in, in effect, um, I, I've earned political capital and here's what I want in exchange, was so repugnant that uh, unusually for me, Jillian, I found myself quite speechless. It took me a moment before I, I was able to say, uh, perhaps diplomatically, but I hope as clearly as I possibly could, um, if this foreign minister went to Auschwitz, it was an obligation of this foreign minister to go to Auschwitz. It was not a favor to AJC or to the Jewish world. It was a confrontation with Austria's history, which was represented in Auschwitz among the perpetrators. You asked about Yevgeny Primakov, who at the time was foreign minister. Um, we were sitting at the uh, Russian, mi the Russian mission to the UN on East 67th Street, across from Park East Synagogue. Uh, and uh, we had regular meetings with the Russians throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, including Primakov. He was tough, he was a, an old Arabist he had uh, been in, in, in Russian intelligence, Soviet intelligence for many years. But there came a point in the conversation and he was speaking in Russian. Uh, so I had the advantage as a Russian speaker of hearing him in Russian and then hearing their interpreter translate into English for the benefit of the other members of our delegation who did not speak Russian. So I heard it twice. I heard him refer to um, a terrorist attack in Latin America um, in 1994, um, which the Russians had picked up wind of in advance and passed along the information. Um, it had not been acted on, he said. And lo and behold, for those who recall, um, there were actually two terror attacks in Argentina, 1992, 1994, both involving Iran, both involving Hezbollah. In the first, 29 people killed in the second 85 people killed. And in both cases to this day, um, fingers pointed, but no one's sitting in jail. So I thought this was pretty remarkable that Primakov was telling us that they had prior intelligence on at least one of these two terror attacks. So I took this information and I shared it um, with um, our friends in Argentina who were still sort of on and off, that's a whole other story. 
pursuing the investigation. I shared this with our friends in Washington because American authorities were also uh, focused on the investigation. And I shared this with our friends in Israel. Later, the investigating judge in Argentina actually summoned me as a, um, I don't know what the exact term was then, but as a witness and asked me to fly from New York to Buenos Aires in order to be questioned about this meeting with Primakov. So I flew from New York to Buenos Aires to meet the investigating judge and his team who questioned me. And again, there was limited information because it was this, you know, this, this one moment of a couple of minutes and then it was over. Um, and they took it all down and then they instructed their ambassador, the Argentine ambassador to Moscow to pursue this and to seek a meeting with Primakov uh, to follow up. And the end of the story, I'm sorry to say, is that Primakov completely denied that he ever said it. Uh, the Russian system completely shut down, but he said it. I heard it twice. The other members of our delegation heard it once in English. I heard it twice in English and Russian. And to the very best of my knowledge, despite many efforts by the Argentines, I believe by the Americans and Israelis as well, there was no other intelligence information forthcoming from the Russians on this, these terror attacks. Such an incredible frustrating. story. Yeah. Very frustrating. Yeah. Very frustrating. David, I know we're headed towards the end of the hour and there's still so much that oh we God. haven't gotten to. I'm getting warmed up. <laughs> I know. So maybe we'll have to have a part two of highlights and lessons learned because there's still a lot to cover. But can you share with us something from your career that you haven't discussed publicly with us before? And then also maybe if you can add, were there any disappointments or, or any issues that were particularly hard to deal with um, in your, your time as CEO? <laughs> You're opening up a whole other hour. And, and try and fit it in three minutes or less. <laughs> I, see, I see I see. the clock ticking in front of me. Um, I, I think my biggest disappointment um, here was the failure, and please note, on three separate occasions to um, complete a merger with the American Jewish Congress. Uh, there were three separate attempts, um, each one lasting several months. They were all kept very quiet. Uh, this is not the place to go into exactly what happened and why they failed. But I think for the good of the Jewish community, it would have made a lot of sense to bring these two organizations together. Uh, in the past, there was always confusion, both because of the initials, AJC, because of overlapping missions um, for many years. Um, and so I still feel that uh, the opportunity was there. Uh, I'm not assigning blame, but nonetheless, I'm saying that um, I still wish we could have tried even harder to overcome whatever opposition or obstacles there were and make it happen. It would have been good for the Jewish community. And I think ultimately it would have been good for, for both organizations. Uh, we have time for the, the other? Yes, we have, we have time for one more. So maybe something, me, me something, you haven't, something you haven't shared publicly with an AJC audience before. <laughs> um, I think it was the Ethiopia, something about the Ethiopia yeah, mission. We, 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 we played a role in, in the exodus of Ethiopian Jews that um, has, has largely gone unspoken until now. That takes us back to the early 1980s. Um, my early years at AJC uh, before, before I took on this job. Um, and it, it had to do with the fact that there were some people in neighboring countries to, um, to Ethiopia that I had come to know over the years um, through other lives, my academic life in particular, and that um, helped create um, a knowledge trail of how to um, bring out Ethiopian Jews and eventually get them to Israel. So again, as you see, I still feel somewhat uncomfortable going into more specifics, but um, the more public 
of work we've done it was with the rescue of Soviet Jews, which was for AJC and for me personally um, a sacred mission. But there is there is another story here about the work with Ethiopian Jews in, in another remarkable story. And I would just end because this is Passover. Um, we, we, we read about, uh, we think about, we try and put ourselves in the shoes of having been slaves in Egypt and the journey from, 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 from slavery to liberation. Um, but there are also two modern day exoduses that's, that's, that we've experienced that I've lived, that I've seen up close that should be added, I believe, to the liturgy of, of, of Passover. Uh, and now we're beginning to see a third exodus of Jews from Ukraine. Again, a reminder of why Israel exists, why it is essential to Jews around the world, and why we need to keep this very much in mind when talking about Israel and the meaning of Zionism. And with that, Jillian, uh, we've only skimmed the surface, but it's been fun and thank you. Thank you, David. As always, it's a privilege to be in conversation with you. It's really not easy to fit a lifetime of Jewish advocacy in one hour, but thank you for being so open about the highlights and, and lessons learned. Chag Sameach, everyone, and Claire, with that, back to you to close us out. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jillian, for sharing your insights, and thank you to our global audience for tuning in today. And don't forget, AJC Global Forum is back and in person June 12th to 14th in New York City. Join us at the historic Temple Emmanuel as we tackle important issues like combating the rise of anti-Semitism, countering Iranian aggression, strengthening Israel's place in the world, and defending our democratic values. To register, please visit ajc.org slash global forum. There are limited seats available and you won't want to miss it. Thank you again. Goodbye.